to see all of you today. Bright colors, smiling faces. It's Easter Sunday. We say, He is risen, and you say, We're full of hope as a result of the resurrection of Jesus. And um, one thing, though, that I'm keenly aware of is that although we may be full of hope, and I say we, I don't mean necessarily all of us, but some of us are full of hope. That's not the case for everyone, right? It's not the case for everyone in the world. I mean, you think about some of the mission moments that we listen to. I mean, a mom sharing a bed with a 12-year-old in prison, and, you know, how much hope is there? And and I'll be honest, there's a lot of hopelessness that I see, you know, right here. Um, And not just out there, even even within the church at times. Um, I've talked to some young couples. I've heard, sometimes I've heard people say things like, you know, I don't... I don't know if I want to bring a child into this world. You ever hear anyone say that? Like, I don't know if I want to bring a child into this world. You know, there's such a, a sense of hopelessness uh, with where things are at. Or, or people who have kids, they say, you know, um, they have the sense of despair when they talk about the future and, um, you know, just not a lot of hope. Or some people who, you know, if my candidate doesn't win, man, America's hopeless, Right? You've heard me talk about the AI revolution, right? It's kind of crazy right now. Some people are scared, like the robots are going to take over. <laughs> like they're afraid of the future, right? War. I mean, look what's going on in Russia, Ukraine, um, Israel. It's horrific. There's a lot of darkness in the world, right? I mean, that's just a reality. There's a, there's a lot of darkness, and sometimes darkness can feel overwhelming. But I'm here today, and I believe that we're here today because I know, and some of you know, that there's a light in this world that the darkness cannot overcome. Amen? 2,000 years ago, that light appeared, and... and and, and when Jesus stepped into the world, I mean, man, the, the followers, his followers were full of hope. And then there was a moment where it appeared that that light had gotten snuffed out, right? But then three days later, that light burned brighter than ever. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So no matter where you're at, what you're going through, if you feel full of hope or hopeless, I want you to know this morning that all hope is not lost. You may have lost hope, but hope is not lost because Jesus has risen from the dead. No matter what situations we face in this world, in our lives, in our families, I'm here to tell you that there's hope. Now, we've been teaching through the book of Luke on Sunday mornings, and uh, I'm actually going to continue that this morning. The passage that we're in is just a a great springboard into Resurrection Sunday. But let me just give you a little bit of a background. Jesus, he is, he's been sharing the good news of the kingdom of God with his disciples and anybody who would listen. He'd say things like, the kingdom of God is present. You can enter in. And and essentially what what he said was, believe in me and follow me. And then he went around, he did all these miracles. You see him healing people. He's casting out demons. He's feeding people, 5,000 with a few fish. I mean, all of these miracles, and all these miracles are showing the people who are following that the kingdom of God is here. It's something that you can be a part of. And he continues to share this message. And the disciples start to believe that, hey, maybe he's the Messiah. And they, they actually start to believe that he is the Messiah. Now, the thing that we need to understand is that most people at that time, the disciples who were following Jesus, the religious leaders, they thought that the Messiah was going to come and that he was going to deliver God's people from Roman oppression. It was going to kind of be like a military Messiah. There was going to be this political overthrow. That's what they were expecting. But the deliverance that God had planned was so much different than anyone could have imagined or expected that there came this moment when it seemed like all hope was lost. Jesus, the one who they thought was the Messiah, all of a sudden is arrested, he's beaten, and he's hanging on a cross, and they feel like all hope is lost. 
It, it's, it's one of those times where they thought God was going to do something one way, and what he did was totally different. Have you ever been there? Have you ever had one of those situations where you've been praying for something or someone, and you have this expectation that God's going to do something, and he does it totally different, or maybe like heaven feels a little bit silent. Maybe you've had a friend or a loved one and you've prayed for that person, they're sick and you're praying for God to, to heal them and it doesn't happen. Or, or you have a, a child who is not making the best of decisions and you're praying and you're believing God and, and rather than those decisions getting better and, and that, that child drawing closer to God, they just seem to be making poorer and poorer decisions. Or the promotion or opportunity that's before you and, and you're about to step through it and you think it just looks like a slam dunk and now all of a sudden the door gets slammed shut. When those things happen, we can find ourselves with a sense of, of hopelessness. But if the resurrection of Jesus teaches us anything, it's that when all hope seems to be lost, there's still hope. All hope is not lost. In our passage today, Jesus is trying to prepare the disciples for this moment where they're going to find themselves absolutely hopeless. Luke 18, verses 31 to 34. Taking the 12 disciples aside, Jesus said, Listen, we're going to go up to Jerusalem where all the predictions of the prophets concerning the Son of Man will come true. He'll be handed over to the Romans and he'll be mocked, treated shamefully, and spit on. They will flog him with a whip and kill him, but on the third day he will rise again. But they didn't understand any of this. The significance of his words were hidden from them, and they failed to grasp what he was talking about. Let's pray. God, many times when we read your word or, or hear your word, it's like we, we fail to grasp the meaning of it, just like the disciples. God, I pray by your spirit this morning you would open our minds, open our hearts to what you have to say to us. God, that you would speak directly to each one of us what we need to hear. God, I thank you that you're with us and that we're not alone and what we're talking about is true, that you rose from the dead and you're alive and you're in our midst today. And so bring clarity to our minds, open our hearts. If anyone in here is hopeless, God, bring them hope. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Jesus is very specific, right? He tells the disciples what's going to happen. And for some reason, the significance of his words are hidden from them. Okay, we're not, we don't know why. But we do know that Jesus, he continued to prepare them. He's trying to prepare them for what's to come. And he even, he reveals the ultimate outcome. He's like, listen, on the third day, or he's like, the Messiah is going to die, and then on the third day, he's going to rise from the dead, right? And so he's, he's letting them know exactly what's going to happen. He's preparing them. He knew what was going to happen. Jesus knew that he was going to go to Jerusalem and that he was going to be arrested. He knew that he was going to be betrayed by one of his disciples. He knew that Peter would deny him. He knew that they would all scatter, and he knew it was going to be devastating. And he knew that the moment would come when all of them, all of his followers, would feel hopeless. And he knew it wasn't too far off. So he tells the disciples, we're heading toward Jerusalem, and this is what's going to happen. Lays it out for him. And this isn't the first time he said this. Now, back in Luke 9, which this is, we've been teaching in Luke for over a year, so this was a while back, so let me refresh your memory. Luke 9, verses 21 to 22, Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone who he was. The Son of Man must suffer many terrible things, he said. He'll be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day he will be raised from the dead. So after he says this to the disciples, verse, 30, or verse 51 says, As the time drew near for him to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So from chapter 9, he is headed toward Jerusalem. He is resolute. He is fixed on what he needs to do. He knows what's coming. He knows he's going to be arrested. He knows he's going to be crucified, but he is set on heading to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. And that's what he says in our passage today. They're heading toward 
Jerusalem. He knows what he needs to do. He's ready, but his disciples, they're not, okay? And the fact that they're not is evident in just many parts of the story. But one is when Jesus ultimately gets to Jerusalem and when the, the Roman soldiers come around and they're going to arrest Jesus, Peter, one of his disciples, we're told he pulls out a sword and he just goes and cuts one of the dude's ears off. Like, he's like, he's like a, not today, Satan. All right, he's like, this is not happening. You're not taking my guy. And he literally pulls out a sword and he cuts the guy's ear off. Now, this is, this is all part of God's plan. He doesn't know that. So what does Jesus do? Jesus is like, Peter, put the sword away. He's like, my kingdom isn't of this world. If it was of this world, it'd be a different story, okay? My kingdom's not of this world. And when you read the text, it's actually kind of humorous because at some point, Jesus, he, he, he gets the ear and he heals the guy, okay? And which had to be really crazy, right? These guys are going to, they're going to arrest Jesus. The guy gets his ear cut off. This is one of the soldiers. The dude that they're going to arrest heals his ear. And then they proceed to arrest him, okay? And he goes, listen, my kingdom is not of this world. But what I'm trying to say is in that moment, Peter was just so dumbfounded by it all. He didn't know what was happening. And he's just ready to throw down, do whatever he needed to, to defend Jesus. Because he, it just took him by surprise. Jesus is arrested. He's beaten beyond recognition, mocked, spit on, ultimately crucified. We talked about this at the Good Friday service, if you were there. Um, and Paul tells us in Romans why all this needed to happen. Romans 5, 6 to 9. When we, were true, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right with God, or made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. Jesus died for our sin, for my sin, for your sin, for the sin of the world. If you want to know whether or not God loves you, just look at the cross. Paul says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. And it's through the blood of Jesus that we're made right with God. And we're saved from God's condemnation. He says that specifically in there. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Now, we have the benefit of Paul's writings, right? We can read these things. We can understand. Now, in the moment... Jesus' followers, they, they didn't understand anything that was going on. They're expecting the Messiah to deliver them physically, and they're expecting this resounding victory, you know, for God's people to have the victory and, and overthrow Rome. And there he is, hanging on a cross. Now, just imagine, if that was your expectation, and your leader is beaten brutally beyond recognition, and now he's hanging on a cross. In that moment, for all of those men and women, all hope was lost. Luke 24, verses 1 to 7. But something happened. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, so they went in. But they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there, puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who's alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Don't you remember? Didn't you get it? Now, these are the women who are closest to Jesus. They're bringing spices. They're going to prepare uh, his body. And when they get there, the stone is rolled away. Now, just so you know, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could walk out. We'll see that later. Jesus could get out. He didn't need the stone to be rolled away. The stone was rolled away so they could see in. The stone was rolled away as a testimony to everyone who would come and see 
that he wasn't there. So the women get there, and they're confused. They don't, they don't know what's going on. These two angels appear to them, and, and the, the ladies are, are terrified, and they're like, hey, don't you remember what he said? He told you he was going to rise from the dead, and he has. Don't you remember what he said, the things he did? And then look at verses 8 and 9. Then they remembered that he had said this. It's like, boom, their, their minds and hearts are opened up. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. So the ladies are the first ones to see the empty tomb. We've talked about this before, but I don't want to pass over it. I mean, it's an amazing thing. By God's providence, he purposefully had these women be the first ones to testify of the resurrection. In fact, the first person that Jesus appears to as he's risen from the dead is Mary Magdalene. Now, in this time, women were marginalized to the point where their testimony wasn't even valid in a court of law. It's like God's doing something here. He's teaching people something. He's teaching us something. He's teaching us the value of all people. He's flipping culture upside down, and he brings this message through the women who, would, who at that time would have been like, you know, that would not be something that's expected. God does the unexpected, and he teaches us in moments like this, and, and so they rush back, and they tell the, the 11 what has happened. Now, we, if you read the story, as they all hear it, Peter and John then rush to the tomb. John's account, he makes it really clear. I don't know why. Maybe John has a little pride, just dealing with it, whatever. But in his account, he makes it real, real clear. They ran to the tomb, and John's like, just so you know, I got there first, okay? So I, you know, like in case you were wondering, I was the first one there, and sure enough, the tomb was empty. And they experienced the empty tomb, all right? So the moment when all of their dreams of victory, all of their hope is lost, all of their dreams have died, Jesus has risen from the dead, and all of a sudden, things start to change. Their thoughts about everything change. They're, they're, they begin to have hope again. Their, their dreams are, are resurrected, and, and so they start to believe they've seen them. Mary Magdalene saw them, and then all the other 11 see him, and all but one of the disciples, well, actually two, but you know, we're not going to talk about Judas this morning. Okay, we'll leave that for another message. But Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to all of them. All right, and so Thomas is not there. Here, look at verse 24 to 25. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, I'm not going to believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Talk about losing hope. I mean, this is one of Jesus' closest followers. I mean, he's one of the, he's one of the original 12. His best friends who've been hanging around with Jesus for uh, you know, all this time, three years, his best friends come to him and say, listen, we saw him. He's alive. He's like, not going to buy it. It's like, I, you know, I mean, just imagine. Again, they're hoping for one thing. Something totally different happens. He saw him hanging on the cross. He's like, I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Now, why would he be so adamant? Why would he be so hopeless in that moment? Now, I, I have to wonder what that discussion would have been like with the with the other disciples. They're telling him he's alive. They've seen him. Thomas is like, I'm not going to believe it. And, you know, in that moment, you know, they're probably fearful for this guy's eternal salvation, right? Like, if it was today, we'd be going, man, Thomas, yeah, that guy, he deconstructed. He's like, that dude's lost his sauce. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have a chance. He doesn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. That would have probably been their attitude, probably, okay? So the question is, how does God respond in a moment like that? What is God going to do? We don't know exactly how the disciples responded, but you know what? We do know how God responded. Verse 26, eight days later, the disciples were together again. So for eight days, Thomas is like, he's an unbeliever at this point. 
Eight days later, the disciples were together again. At this time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. What's Thomas's response in that moment? My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told them, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Here's the thing, man. Jesus meets Thomas in his unbelief. Jesus meets Thomas in his hopelessness. He doesn't rebuke him. He meets him right where he's at. And he shows him who he is. And, and in that moment, it's like Thomas for eight days who just wasn't believing anyone. He's just, it's like my Lord, my God, like in that moment he realizes who Jesus really is. So what does this teach us about Jesus? He's patient. He's full of love, full of compassion. And I just want to say this. Doubters, you're welcome. Skeptics are welcome. Questions are welcome. I mean, look at verse 29. Look what he said. He said, he told them, you believe because you've seen me, says the Thomas. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. We don't have the privilege of seeing the resurrected Jesus in person, right? Because he, he realizes it's harder. Like Thomas, he, even though all of his friends saw it, he wasn't believing it until he saw it with his own eyes. And he goes, blessed are you because you've seen. Now, or, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. And, and that's where some of us find ourselves today, right? We're like, man, you got questions. Like I said earlier, you've prayed for things that haven't come to pass. God hasn't met you in the way that you expected. And sometimes we do feel hopeless. Sometimes we have all of these questions. And I just want to say, I don't think Jesus has changed at all from the way he interacted with Thomas and his disposition toward Thomas in those moments of hopelessness, questioning, and unbelief. He meets us right where we're at and he shows us, hey, I'm here. I'm alive. I might not do things the way you desire for me to do them. I might not do them along your timeline. But make no mistake about it. I am at work. And I love you. And I'm with you. And I just love that. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope. I can't say it enough. I don't know where I saw this. Someone um, used the acronym for hope. And they said, hold on. Pain ends. And sometimes we just got to hold on, right? You hold on. You're praying. You're believing God. Hold on. Because he is at work. So there's one more story before we wrap up that I want to share with you about resurrected hope that we find in the scripture. We're told that there were two other disciples. Um, these two guys leave, a May or leave Jerusalem, and they're walking on this road to a village called Emmaus. It's a seven-mile walk. So they're walking there, and as they're walking, they're talking about everything that happened. And they're saying things like, man, we really believe that he was, he was the one. They're talking about Jesus. Like, we, we hoped he was the Messiah. We believed he was the one, and they're, they're having this discussion. And as they have this discussion, someone kind of like, like saddles up next to them and starts walking with them, some dude. And they're just, they're, you know, kind of looking over their shoulder, and he starts walking. And then he just starts asking questions like, hey, hey, what are you guys talking about? Now, the scripture tells us that this is Jesus, but they're kept from seeing who he is. I don't know how that works, some Jedi mind trick. I don't know what's going on. All I know, they're walking, questioning, and asking all these things. Jesus comes alongside. They don't realize it's him. And he starts going, hey, what, what's going on? Look at verses uh, 17 and 21 of Luke 24. He asked them, Jesus, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. Notice how they say, the man, now. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they 
Look at verse 21. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come. But now he's dead. All hope is lost. And so Jesus continues to walk with them, and, and we're told that he, he opens up the scriptures to them, not like physically, but he starts talking to them about what Moses said. He starts talking to them about the prophets, and he starts explaining all the things about the Messiah. And they finally get to their destination, and we're told that like something was stirring in their hearts as Jesus was talking to them, as Jesus was teaching. And they didn't know it was him, but something stirring inside of them. They get to Emmaus, they beg this man, Jesus, to stay and eat with them. Look at verse 30. As they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it, and he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Jesus is doing some pretty cool stuff, right? Like, I mean, he appears in a room where all the doors are locked. He's just disappearing. Now, that's what I said earlier. Like, the, the stone didn't need to be rolled away. He was coming out, right? I mean, so, boom, he's gone. And, and here's the thing I love about the story and one of the reasons why we chose the name Emmaus for, for the church is that here you have these two men. They're, they're totally discouraged. They've lost hope. They're like, man, we thought he was the guy. And, and he, you know, at that point, they're like, he wasn't. We hoped he was the Messiah. And in their discouragement and, frankly, unbelief, Jesus starts walking with them. And he starts talking to them. And he starts asking them questions. And he starts teaching them. He comes alongside them. And what does he do? He restores their hope. And I just want to say this, and, and it, like again, it's why we chose this, the name for the church. God is with us, even in our unbelief at times, even in our doubt, even in our struggle. He is with us, and he is drawing us to himself, and maybe that's where you find yourself today. Maybe you came, you just came with someone because you're going to brunch after church. I don't know. But I do know this, you're here for a reason. And the Spirit of God's at work. He's at work in all of our hearts, and he's drawing us to himself. And that's what he did with these two guys. They went from being hopeless to full of hope. Look, verse 32. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. So these dudes just walked seven miles, okay, I don't know how long that takes. It takes me a long time. That'd be the whole day for me, probably. So you walk seven miles, and within the hour, they're heading back. I mean, something happened to these guys. They're going back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and, all, and the others who have gathered with them, who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him as he was breaking the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. Again, boom. Jesus didn't want to walk the seven miles. He said, forget that. I'm just like, go hang out with the Father for a little while. Boom, he's back. I don't know how, I don't know what happened. But, okay, so all of a sudden, he's there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened thinking they were seeing a ghost. Are you kidding me right now? I mean, <laughs> I mean, Peter saw him, Mary Magdalene saw him, they all saw him, Thomas saw him, these two guys. Then Jesus appears, all right, guys, here I am, it's on, hope is back. And they freak out, it's a ghost, right? <laughs> and <laughs> this passage goes on to actually tell us. Now, this is what's amazing to me. It goes on to say they were filled with doubt. Still filled with doubt. He appeared to them all these different times. Thomas had this face-to-face, close-up, you know, put your hands in moment. And they're still doubting. How will Jesus handle their doubt this time? Look at verse 38. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost. 
because ghosts don't have bodies as you see I do as he spoke he showed them his hands and his feet still look at verse 41 they stood there in disbelief filled with joy and wonder there's like confusion like then he asked them do you have anything here to eat they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he ate it as they watched listen Jesus again if this doesn't teach us something about the patience of God I don't know what will but again he meets them in the middle of their doubt he basically goes Thomas 2.0 on them alright guys you need to see you need to touch do whatever you need to do I'm not a ghost still they stood in disbelief so what does Jesus do I love this he's like you got anything to eat I think this is going to take a while alright it's like and so he just sits there and they all they all watch him Jason, you guys can come back up. The band can come back up. And they're looking in awe and wonder and disbelief. Now listen, listen. These were the guys who walked with Jesus. These were the guys who heard him talk about the kingdom. These are the guys who, who not only saw miracles but had, were able to take part in them when he sent them out. I mean, all of these things, and yet after three different, four different appearances of the resurrected Jesus, they're still doubting. And so I just want to say to all of us in this room, listen, I don't know where you're at this morning in your soul. I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you walked in here feeling hopeless. I don't know if you walked in here full of doubt. But I do know this, that God will meet you right where you're at and if there's one thing I've learned from the biblical account and just walking with Jesus for 30 plus years, it's that God loves you and regardless of where you're at in your place of faith he is with you and he is just waiting for you to turn to him and he'll walk with you through your doubt the God of love and grace desires for you and me and everyone in the world really to experience a fullness of life that I'm going to say this it's only available through Jesus and I know that's a bold claim. But you know what else is a bold claim? I'm going to die, and in three days, I'm going to rise from the dead. And it happened. Fullness of life is found in Jesus. And because he died and rose from the dead, he has life to offer all of us. doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, God loves you. He came for you. He died for you, and he invites you to believe and to follow him. As we read earlier, God shows his great love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, he knew how messed up we were, and he still chose to die for us. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Pray for us, and we're going to sing this last song together. I don't know everything about God. I don't know everything about how God works. But the one thing that I am fully convinced of today as I stand here is that God is a loving God who is patient, who is kind, who is full of compassion. And my prayer is that everybody in this room would know him and know who he really is, this God of love who came. So if you would, let's pray together. God, thank you for your love and grace and thank you for the scripture that's not some sanitized version that just makes it unbelievable but real people going through real stuff people who aren't believing people who are struggling just like all of us in this room God thank you for your patience thank you for your kindness thank you for your love and your compassion I pray that if there's anybody in here who doesn't know that or anybody who feels hopeless God, we just turn to you and receive your love and receive your grace. Fullness of life that comes through faith in Jesus. And I ask it in the name of the resurrected Christ.